from the mountains to the deep blue sea everything in perfect harmony and as the stars fill the evening sky without a sensing life is passing by so if you want a solution my friend assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh welcome back to raising children the program concerning marital and children's issues. Tonight we're going to be talking about single parenting and how certain people in Islam become single parents through. You know this is the dilemma that we have today. Too many single parents. Is that we right? We get some of these people married and we need to take yeah. care of these children. Well, they lead, lead by example, Tahir. Hey, I'm ready. <laughs> okay, good. I'm good in marriage. That's <laughs> yes, good. There, there is a problem, isn't there? Because um, single parents, I don't think there were too many of them in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu that naturally someone would take up. So they would marry her. Sure, I mean the Prophet Sallallahu set this example. He did. He only married one virgin. The rest of his wives were either married before, or, I mean were married before, they were widowed like this. Yeah. Uh, so this was a situation and of course the families at that time were very close-knit. Unfortunately we, today we're seeing a different situation globally and as a result of so-called globalization we're seeing also this apparent impact on families everywhere and even here in the, in the Middle East. So single parent, the modern single parent is really single, is all alone in the world usually. It's real but I think uh, if we want to talk about the Middle East or the Muslim family it's a little different yes, because uh, the family is still close-knit. The girls generally even if let's say she's been divorced or husband dies well, she goes back to her father's house. So she doesn't generally live away from her family. Yeah. And there is the possibility of remarriage. And of course, that, that possibility is there. And the children still have a family structure. Yeah. Maybe the father's not there. Or... And now he takes, uh, takes care of the children. He remarries. Or even if he doesn't remarry, he generally may move into the, his parents' house or have a house. His mother will come and live with him. A lot of different situations. Maybe his mother... His father's not living, his mother will come and live with him, or maybe he will move into his parents' house, or maybe he'll have his own house, possibly, and remarry. This is the advantage of the extended family. Sure. Is you always got some support. So the children always have this family structure that's there. It's not like, well, it's just me and my dad, or just me and my mom out there alone against so when, the world. When we're talking about single parents in Islam, we're generally referring to converts, aren't we? Yeah, I, I would say the higher percentage like this, people who come from other societies, not, not the Muslim society, mm. this is not still what you would say customary. The customary thing is to be with your family, yeah. male or female. Uh, of course, Western societies, and not only Western society, we'll say other societies, are more orientated towards, okay, once you become an adult, you leave home, and maybe never to return. Yeah. We've got a call now, Tahir. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Uh, you're a single parent, I hear. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your situation? Um, actually, I remarried recently, but I raised oh, my daughter uh, for 18 years all by myself. Oh, 18 years? Yes. Hmm. Are you a convert to Islam or are you a born no, Muslim? No, I'm a born Muslim. I see, I see. So tell us a little bit about the hardships you faced during those 18 years. Well, the beginning was um, a, a difficult time to go through because um, it all happened uh, so suddenly because um, I was married for about a year or a little over a year and I had a daughter who was one year old and uh, a few months and this marriage never worked from the very beginning so and it um, didn't work out so we had to split. Right. When we split, I had to take, I took my daughter with me. according to Islam. And did you go back to your father's house or did you...? No, I had my sisters with me. Okay. So uh, I had two sisters with me and I had a brother here in the UAE. So mm. I, I moved in with them, uh, with my daughter. Right. And you worked during this time? I mean, you yes, had a yes. Mm. yes, I did work. I mean, I was working at that time. Um, it wasn't very easy having a little baby who was one year, three months and who not used to my family at that time. Uh, so I had to find uh, babysitters, yes, um, yes. housemates, and alternate help to 
keep her during the day and come back in the evening to pick her up and take her home and you know do the take care of her the rest of the evening. When you discuss this now with your daughter who's 18 or so, um, does she give you any insights into what difficulties she faced? Um, no, not so far. I mean, she's never ever uh, said anything. Um, she doesn't remember anything. And I think um, even though we, uh, we were alone for such a long time, um, I mean, amazingly, alhamdulillah, if I look back 18 years, I really thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for everything that he's given us. Because I think basically the mother plays a big role in raising that. As far as uh, uh, my role was concerned, it was my niya to raise my child according to Islam. Right. And this niya really helped me go a long way, not only just raise my child um, in an Islamic environment, in Islamic society, uh, within my family and my values, they also helped me uh, to, to grow Islamically and to, to be a better person because I had a responsibility. And we shared a lot of things together. And it, I wouldn't describe it as a painful experience, but it was a beautiful experience where mm. we grew out as friends. We grew up as, you know, people who understood each other, who shared the situation. And we are like friends today. You know, we could communicate. And, and really, when we look back, I don't think my daughter would have missed her father so much. I wouldn't say she never missed. I would say she had my family, she had everything, and sometimes I would say she even had more than And Allah showed us many ways, and I think this is mainly because of the niya that you make, that you want to raise your child. Yeah, niya, for those who don't know, perhaps some non-Muslims are watching, means intention, doesn't it? You have a, yeah, it, it's actually the intention. It's the intention to do something, the, the intention behind an action. Yeah. yeah, right. Thank you very much, sister. You're welcome. Tahir, it's like you were saying, you know, that the Muslim single parent usually doesn't ha don't have it so bad. Because what the sister was saying, you know, the family support was there. So, I mean, this is essential, of course. The family support is uh, very important, as she mentioned. It had been very difficult for her if she had been a single parent and she had to live on her own, yeah. and then just her and her child a small uh, infant, and uh, she had to fend for herself. Extremely difficult. There are women who do it. I mean, I'm from, you know, in America, in there's America, lots yeah. of women. Uh, like Social Security. Well, I, I don't know how many people can live on Social Security these days. I think it's a little, <laughs> a little difficult yeah. to live on it solely. Hmm. I think same thing, some of the, many women, what they do, of course, they come back to their mothers or their mothers live oh, along yeah. with them. Now, of course, the daycare center, the daycare center has been a big thing in America for a very long time for working mothers. Uh, even in the welfare system, they have some programs where they have uh, daycare services for the children so the women can go to work. They have programs where women can be trained to get skills, a lot of different types of things to try to combat these types of situations. In the UK, you had a very, a very serious problem in the UK with teenage pregnancies. As oh, example. yes. So, I mean, people are trying to find solutions to this particular issue, and of course, the, the solution is, you know, counseling about marriage before marriage. Yeah. And like you said, what is your need? What is your intention for getting married, yeah. both male and female? So young people need to be groomed as to why you should get married, who you should get married. And as we talked about in another program, the issue here again is Sex education. There has to be some sex education in sure, a non-Muslim society. Uh, one of those uh, TV stations, isn't it? <laughs> yes. But, uh, I mean, for the non-Muslim society, although they've had sex education, it hasn't really helped. Well, what kind of sex education do they have? They said, okay, uh, in the high school now, we're going to provide the kids with prophylactics. That sex education says, well, you know. It's by your own free will, whatever. You're old enough now, you have Morning no mind. after pills. That's yeah. ridiculous. That's absurd. And people say, well, you know, you are old-fashioned. Uh, you know, so, well, my, my question comes to what religion accepts that? Yeah, actually, if, if we're talking about Christian, Judo-Christian society, yeah. come on, give me a break. You don't really know about the Judo-Christian creed right. at that's all, right. if that's acceptable. 
So this criteria that people are using is a little backwards. I'm sorry, brother. We'll have to stop you a moment now because we have to take a break now. Inshallah, we'll take a break and uh, we'll be back after the break to continue this uh, discussion and raising children. Like every sunrise, every sunrise, every for these days. Welcome back. You're watching Raising Children. I'm your host, Uthman Barry. And we're going to continue the subject with our guest, Taya Khaled. Are you still on the line, sister? Yes, I am, brother. And as far as... Uh... Islam. Right. And this Nia really helped me go a long way. Not only just raise my child um, in an Islamic environment, in Islamic society, uh, within my family and my values, they also helped me... Uh, to, to grow Islamically and to, to be a better person because I had a responsibility and, and we, we shared a lot of things together and it, I wouldn't describe it as a painful experience but it was a beautiful experience where mm. we grew out as friends, we grew up as you know people who understood each other, who shared the situation and we are like friends today, you know, we could communicate and, and really, when you look back, I, I don't think my daughter would have missed her father so much. I wouldn't say she never missed. I would say she had my family, she had everything, and sometimes I would say she even had more than what two parents could give her. Right. So she was a very fortunate child, and Allah showed us many ways. And I think this is mainly because of the Nia that you make, that you want to raise your child. Yeah, Nia, for yourself. those who don't know, perhaps some non-Muslims are watching means intention, doesn't it? You have a... Yeah, it, it's actually the intention. It's the... the inten yeah. yeah, right. Thank you very much, sister. Tahir, it's like you were saying, you know, that the Muslim single parent usually doesn't ha don't have it so bad. Because what the sister was saying, you know, the family support was there. So, I mean, this is essential, of course. The family support is uh, very important, as she mentioned been very difficult for her if she had been a single parent and she had to live on her own yeah. and then this her and her child a small uh, infant and she had to fend for herself extremely difficult there are women who do it i mean i'm from you know in america in there's america, lots yeah. of women who do this how, every day how do women do that in america they they live on uh, like social security well I, I don't know how many people can live on social security these days i think it's a little, <laughs> a little difficult yeah. to live on it solely hmm. i think same thing some of the, many women, what they do, of course, they come back to their mothers or their mothers live uh, in America for a very long time yeah. for working mothers. Uh, even in the welfare system, they have some programs where they have uh, daycare services for the children so the women can go to work. They have programs where women can be trained to get skills, uh, a lot of different types of things to try to combat these types of situations. In the UK, you had a very, a very serious problem in the UK with teenage pregnancies. As oh, example. yes. So, I mean, people are trying to find solutions to this particular issue. And, of course, the, the, the solution is, you know, counseling about marriage before marriage. Yeah. And, like you said, what is your need? What is your intention for getting married, yeah. both male and female? So, young people need to be groomed as to why you should get married, who you should get married. And, as we talked about in another program, how do you stay married? Yeah. The issue here, again, is sex education. There has to be some sex education in sure, a non-Muslim society. Uh, one of those uh, TV stations, isn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, for, for the non-Muslim society, although they've had sex education, it hasn't really helped. Well, what kind of sex education do they have? They said, okay, uh, in the high school now, we're going to provide the kids with prophylactics. That's sex education. says, well, you know. ridiculous it's absurd and people say well you know you are old-fashioned uh, you know says so, well my my question comes to what religion accepts that yeah actually, if, if we're talking about Christian judo Christian society yeah. come on give me a break you don't really know about the judo Christian that's creed right. at that's all right. if that's acceptable uh, so this criteria that people are using is a little backwards yeah sister you were saying before about how the single mother has to compensate for everything um, 
you know, everything that's missing in the child's life, I mean to say, how does she compensate for the lack of a father? What can she do to provide some masculine company for the child? Uh, a very interesting question, but, um, you know, the child is too small to understand. If the child didn't have a relationship with a father, she would never know what it was like. So when a mother compensates, the mother does both the father's and the mother's role by taking the child to the school, picking the child up, bringing the child back, sitting and doing the dining out, going visiting people, everything, including buying the toys. You could do everything. My daughter never missed her father for many, many years. And mm. also we had a family that we had, you know, my brother-in-law, my brother, uh, they were there. So they yeah. saw them, I mean, she saw them as the male figures in the house, but she denied identify them as the father. But as my daughter and I shared this life together, I mean, I educated her gradually about why she didn't have a father and why her father left her. In, a, in such a way that it wasn't very painful and she didn't really feel that she needed one. I, I would think so. Right, right. I mean, for, did, for a did long she time. Attempt to, did she attempt to make any contact with her father uh, in later years? Yes, she did. Mm. Well, uh, when she was about 10 or 12 years, I thought um, I had the responsibility. She, all the time she was going to school and she had friends. And she used to come and tell me about, you know, friends asking her yeah. about her father. And I said to myself, you know, Svala, if something happens to me tomorrow and I know he has custody and he would come and take her and I don't want to be the bad mother. So I said to myself, I will give my daughter that opportunity to get to know her father. If supposing, you know, he yeah. has to come to her rescue, she would know who he is. Very good. Yeah, very good thinking. And it worked out okay between them. Yes, alhamdulillah, because she was brought up in such a way within my family. And I think we managed to mold her to believe, uh, which is the truth, of course, uh, what happened between us and why we separated because and he married again and he had another child. So this fact alone didn't really help her to, you know, to go towards him. Yeah. You know, it held her back from going to him because he already had another daughter. Right. So this situation was slightly different from anybody else. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Just hold a minute, sister. Tahir, what do you have to say about it? Well, you know, I have... Uh, Sounds a very idyllic situation. Yeah, it's a very uh, idealistic situation in some ways. Uh, but, you know, today you have this single parent. You have, you know, men who think they can raise a child without a mother. And but a that's the other issue, isn't it? Yeah. The men. And the women who think they can raise their children without a husband. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not blaming anybody because people deal with situations and circumstances based on their need system. Uh, but at the same time, there's responsibility in both parties. Islamically, of course, men are always responsible for their children. There is no excuse mm. for a man not to be responsible for his children. Whether he's with the mother or not, he's responsible for them. And Mean he will always, support. Yes, he will always be responsible for them. Mm. And especially the daughters. The daughters are always under the father. Right, right. So this is negligence. There's no such thing as a man of fine. You can't get a not to have a continual relationship with his daughter. There's no excuse for, for a young lady or a young man to be looking around for their father. Yeah. As happens in the West, doesn't it? We have many examples. I mean, there. some very terrible examples yeah. of these kind of things. And of course, as you well know, the results of what they call dysfunctional families. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and of course, in America particularly, we have some very, very big problems because of the kids who come out of dysfunctional families and they become extremely violent, extremely vulgar, and so many other kind of things going on with them. Mm. The prisons are full of them. Yes, yes. It creates a social problem, doesn't it? Sure. It's like the children feel themselves unwanted. Oh, we, and this is one of the major reasons for the gangs. We have huge gangs. In America, we have gangs like uh, armies in other countries. Yeah. Tens of thousands of young people in a gang, both male and female. This, and do you this, mean they're all... One gang from the west coast to the east coast, mm. three, more than 3,000 3, miles, cities in between. Mm. So, the so I have to leave you now, yeah, yeah. Uthman, I'm oh, sorry. Right.
And uh, how are we gonna finish it? I don't you? think you can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be talking to you the next time. Okay, thank Salam you. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Sister, salam alaikum. Alaikum salam, brother. Your daughter's 18 now, right? Sorry, say that again. Your daughter? Yes. She's 18 years old. That's right. Yes. Ah, but what uh, what kind of field is she going into? I mean, what are are her talents or what are her inclinations? Um, well, um, she had several options, but uh, I was very particular that she does something that will serve Islam and, you know, uh, the community, basically. Mm -hmm. So oh, I had to convince her to do Sharia law, but uh, we were not able to do that here in the UAE. So she Sri Lanka, and I think, inshallah, if everything goes well, she will specialize in Sharia. Mm -hmm. yes. So she's studying in Sri Lanka at the moment. That's right, yes. Mm. You have family over there? Yes, I do. Okay, right, right. Yeah. The um, the issue, I mean, your your circumstances sounds rather good in, in as much as you had the support of your family. But, uh, for example, if a woman doesn't have that kind of support, you could imagine she would, uh, you know, suffer a great deal. Like we have Taya Khalid, or there's instances in the West where women come to Islam, they've got a child from some previous boyfriend or something, they're not even married, and, uh, you know, they struggle to bring them up themselves. It's mm -hmm. a very difficult situation. Do you see that kind of situation coming amongst the Muslims? Um, no, I haven't uh, come across any sister who have had that situation, but I can tell ladies that do a lot of dawah. If these sisters can engage themselves in these circles, go spend time, it, mm -hmm. it's a big booster for them to stay on the right track. Right. And this will also help them identify somebody really good mm -hmm. because these circles also work towards helping these sisters to find, you know, partners and stuff like that. So That's great. I mean, they, can be, they can be really guided and they can at least stay on track in Islam and, you know, to get the right guidance and a lot of help, really. Right. Thank you Even very much you indeed. Family, yes. We'll have to stop you now as we're coming to the end of the program. Thank you very much for sharing with us your interesting life and your views on child rearing. I'm sure there are many sisters who will find this information very valuable. Assalamu alaikum. Unfortunately, dear viewers, we've come to the end of the program. Rearing children, the Islamic view of marriage and rearing children. And inshallah, we hope you'll join us the next Like every sunrise that brings forth each day Brings new meaning, new hope, a new way Such is the blessing bestowed upon us Every hardship and heartache will pass From the mountains to the deep blue sea Everything in perfect harmony And as the stars fill the evening sky Without a sensing life is passing by So if you want a solution my friend Seize this moment, this day before it ends Turn to him, don't you see it's so clear